kitchen food drives. I always supervise the person who handles those as well. So I, I handle a couple of things here. Um, but in my abundant spare time, um, many, many years ago when I was, I think I had been at the food bank for about a year and a half, I was asked to go do a presentation at Santa Fe Prep. And that's where Making Ends Meet was born because I realized that we really <laughs> the message you know people about people making difficult choices choosing between their medications and food not being able to afford food if they had a repair for their car that needed to happen mm -hmm. but i had never really investigated what that looked like on a micro level for individual families so i used a few resources through the internet i was using the mit living page calculator and what i discovered was um, that it was a lot closer than I thought it was. And people were in more financial trouble than I thought they were. And it really did wonders in terms of informing my understanding of the work. Um, and the Making Ends Meet presentation was sort of born out of that. And it has grown over the past several years and is now in like the fifth year of me presenting this and has really transformed into a perspective taking experience where you can get a firsthand glimpse of what struggling families are experiencing on a monthly basis. So that's what we're going to do today. Okay. All right. Good. I'm letting everybody know that we're recording this so we can share it with other, some other people if they would like to see it. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Good, good. Okay. Do you want to dive in? Yeah. If, if someone is talking while Jill is presenting, we can't always hear Jill. So so maybe, why don't you mute everybody and just have Jill not muted? Yeah. Um, Can you mute everybody? Yeah. We don't mute everybody. Yeah, mute all alternate. and then unmute First Jill. Alternate. alternate then A. I don't know where mute all is. is. Yes, it is. Press that and together maybe we could all mute ourselves if people know how what's the other you guys way? know how do you know how no, to I mute yourself oh, you did it. do you know how to mute your your phone sheila yes you know how am to i mute not it? am i not muted no you're not oh. muted so i'm trying to find the alternate oh. a hmm. there should be a menu that you could just select open up the chat or the participants oh uh, put my glasses on for one thing. Thing. Uh, okay. alternate in a mm. what alternate but we're soft oh okay you see that there we go a. i did in a. okay am i oh. muted not yet oh okay Press 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 Okay. No, not A, not shift. But I was okay. We're on off now. We okay? It's done. What? Come here. We're not all muted. What? Come here, please. We're not muted. Quick. Oh, I see. We all those find guys. the alternate and A O T Well, and A, but I can't see it. Mary is not seeing it. Well, the other thing you can do is the other thing you can do is go over here and see that the mute thing is over here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, here's my disclaimer. Um, if you have had your fill of sad, um, this workshop is probably not for you. Um, we are going to take a trip through a struggling family of four. It's two adults, two children. We're going to step into their shoes and take the perspective of their experience in this world for a little while. And I would set the expectation that this will probably feel a little disheartening, perhaps, um, maybe a little bit heavy. Um, and it may also feel a little uncomfortable. And my challenge to you today would be that you just lean into that um and sit there for a moment and we will talk our way through sort of what this means and i'd like to finish in a place of 
advocacy and action where each of you leaves with some idea of on a very micro personal level or on a macro advocacy level that you can take some action after this workshop um, to bring change in your community or your family or somewhere. Okay. So I don't want to leave you in a big black hole. I just want to show you a little bit of what's behind the veil and then encourage you to take action to affect change on the other side. So we are going to start from a place of understanding what the paradigm is in our current culture um, here in the United States. And I want you to answer this question. You can write this on your paper. I don't want you to be afraid to share with the group. I would like you to write down, select words or phrases that you have heard used to describe people who are experiencing hunger or people who are using food stamps. And that can be your personal opinion, or it can be words you've heard in political conversations, words you've heard in your social groups, words you've heard in the media. Write down several words or phrases you've heard used to describe people experiencing hunger or people who use food stamps. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to do that. And while you're doing that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so don't be surprised if you can't see me anymore. Okay, now we're gonna play the mute and unmute game, okay? So can someone selectively just go ahead and unmute themselves? Make sure you're the only one talking since this is Zoom um, and share with me the words or the phrases. And I'm gonna write them down on the screen that you all can see for me. Okay, well, I'll start. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I, I'm um, down and out, uneducated. Okay. Poor. Okay. Lazy. Yep. Okay. That's my list. Somebody else? Yeah, I got one. Uh, Go minimum wage. Okay. Poverty level. Okay. Uh, medicine versus food. All right. Dis disabled. Yep. Okay. Working mu multiple jobs. Okay. What else? Extended family in the home. Okay. Okay. Young I put, just starting out. Say that again. Young and just starting out. Um, all right. Yep. About unemployed. Got that. Okay. Okay. Sometimes you hear living off the system. Uh-huh, you do, okay. Okay, what else do we have? Lost job due to COVID shutdown. Okay. okay. 
Any other words in there that somebody hasn't had captured? Okay, take a look at this for a second. I think it is really important when we're trying to take perspective that we understand the context that we're existing in. And certainly in a lot of the public discourse, um, being in food banking for a long time, we work really hard to break down myths and assumptions about people who are experiencing hunger. Um, and I think that in facilitating this workshop upwards of 40 times now, we have frequently heard the words lazy and moochers and living off the system come up repeatedly. Uneducated frequently comes up as well. We get a lot of this also. Um, addicts or people that have substance abuse challenges. So certainly a lot of these words are things that come up very frequently. Um, there tends to be a fair amount of judgment in the discourse in public about people who are experiencing poverty and hunger, who are using public assistance programs or safety net programs. So it's an important thing to acknowledge where we're starting out from. Um, when you hear some of these conversations, especially pre-COVID, I think that if there's a silver lining to COVID, it's that our, maybe our conversation is starting to shift um, a little bit because so many more people are unemployed and that was rather abrupt and out of their control. So I think maybe some of the perspective is changing, but in a pre-COVID world, certainly um, hearing lazy and living off the system and taking advantage are pretty common themes that you'll hear in a lot of public spaces about this. It's a good place to start um, in terms of having that conversation. Okay, keep these ideas in mind. I'm gonna come back to the screen a couple of times just to remind us where we started out, okay? The next thing that we are going to do is dive into talking about our family here. So let me switch screens here for you. We are gonna be looking at a family of four. Um, both adults are working full-time minimum wage jobs in Santa Fe County. I know you all are up in Los Alamos, but there's a reason that I like to use Santa Fe County and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. I don't want you to think about their income at all right at this point, okay? We are going to start just with a guessing exercise. Um, and what I want you to do again on your paper is think about typical basic living expenses. And I'm going to have you guys guess for a family of four with two children, you've got a seven year old and a two year old, which is relevant for some expense categories. I'm going to tell you what's in each of these categories. I based this off of the MIT living wage calculator. So that's something you can reference in the future if you want to look at Los Alamos County or other counties around the country. In the transportation category, the figure that we're going to end up with assumes car payments on a used vehicle or two. I think we decided on that it's two. The gas, maintenance, and insurance for those vehicles. For housing, Santa Fe County, two bedroom, two bathroom apartment, and the utilities associated with it. For medical, this is assuming um, it's an average, right? So it is sort of assumes some people are paying for their own premiums and that others are covered by their employer. Um, so the medical is medical coverage, co-pays, premium payments, medication costs, over-the-counter medications, um, and vitamins and supplements and that type of thing. So that's all rolled up in the medical category. Child care. Remember that you have a seven-year-old, you also have a two-year-old, and you have two adults that are working full-time. The other category, oh boy, I'm sorry about that. There you go. The other category is, think about your Target run or your Walmart run. This is basic living expenses. So basic household cleaners, basic personal care items, 
the paper products in your house, toilet paper, paper towels, napkins. Um, it is basic clothing supplements um, and basic personal maintenance, like haircuts and that type of thing. Um, we're not talking about extravagant manicures and really gorgeous dye jobs on your hair, that kind of thing. Um, basic living expenses. And food. This is, if you're familiar with the USDA plans of uh, like the thrifty food plan, the regular food plan, and the really expensive food plan, this is the second least expensive. So not quite eating ramen but definitely not shopping exclusively at Whole Foods. So don't cheat and use the MIT living wage calculator right now, but you guys can unmute yourself and talk as one big group. You can do this by yourself. The ladies all together on the couch can work together. Um, this is intended to sort of be a group activity. I'm gonna give you about six minutes to go through and formulate what you think the expenses in each category are for a family of four living in Santa Fe County. Okay? And you can definitely ask me questions. You can ask me questions in chat if you wanna do that. Um, I'm gonna start the clock and let me know if you have questions. So, are yes. you about monthly expenses? Monthly, or? yes ma'am. Okay. And you may want to think of that on an aggregate level. So if, um, if expenses for school are really big, typically in August, think about how that would add to the budget monthly if you broke it out over 12 months. Um, same thing for like a medical expense. So where are these people working? Doesn't matter. Just think yeah. about typical living expenses. So not for our family necessary, necessarily, but typical basic living expenses oh. for the average family. Oh, okay. okay. You said housing, food, utilities, right? Housing okay. is the two bedroom, two bathroom apartment and utilities. So um, water. It's just gas, water, and electric um, and trash. I just want to say that I really appreciate you doing this because I think a lot of people have no idea. So I really appreciate you teaching others. I realize education is more and more important. We're finding that, aren't we? Let me bring you all. Yeah, yeah, part of what I'm realizing is I have no idea how much childcare is anymore since my kids are <laughs> in their 30s and 20s. <laughs> That's a really valid point. Um, yeah. It's really important for us to be recognizing that. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I have no idea what car payments are because we've never had one. <laughs> also, you know, and I want to just say on the outside, like if I use the phrase privilege, I am not insulting anyone ever. Um, there's some examining of our own privilege here. And just because we have a little bit doesn't mean we have to feel bad about it. It's just worth recognizing that we have it. Um, and I was thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. So is it a piece of privilege to never have a car payment? Absolutely. Do you have to feel bad about that? No. You just have to know that it's not like that for everyone. That's all. <laughs> Okay, do your very best. I know that you might not know. It's okay to guess. We're going to play the prices right with this, okay? <laughs> when you're talking privilege, part of it comes with education and the fact that you plan ahead. Certainly. For things like car payments. Or that you're able to.
There we go. Come on, you. And I know there's variable like where a family might live. So understanding this is Santa Fe. Two this bedroom, bathroom, seven year old, two year old. Yep, Santa Fe County, seven year old, two year old, and two adults. All right. Which from Los Alamos. No. If we could definitely do this for Los Alamos. Um, this one I have developed for Santa Fe because it has a component to it that makes it a little interesting. Okay. I'm, so, so we're raise your hand or actually just say yes if you've got all the categories filled in. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, make sure everybody's off of mute. Um, we're gonna go the price is right style here, okay? First, before we talk numbers here, say yes if you were 100% sure you knew the answer for every single category. Nobody? That's super relevant. Um, so hold on to that. The fact that we've got a nice group of ladies here who no doubt have a lot of different experiences and nobody was 100% sure that they knew exactly how much each category would cost. Um, even though we live in the same kind of geography, we're in a different county, sure. Um, but that's kind of important. So for transportation, why don't you all just call out what your guess was for how much transportation cost? 300. 500. 700. Okay. Any others? And, and that's only for the car payment possibly and not for the gas to get it to go somewhere or maintenance on the transportation. It's all of the above. So it's the car payment plus the insurance, the maintenance, and the gas. Yeah. That's what kills you. That's right. what kills you. Just, just did that. Um, okay, so according to the MIT living wage calculator, which is what we're using for our data sets here. Wow. $919. Now, for Santa Fe County, I'm willing to bet that we're talking about two used cars. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that explicitly, but because of our geography, I'm guessing that with distances and that kind of thing being what they are, that we're talking about two used cars for that number. Um, but I mean, my car expenses run pretty high, I would say. So I can see that being a reasonable number. Um, especially if you consider a maintenance repair, I just replaced all the tires and the brakes on my car. And that aggregated over 12 months will be another hundred plus dollars per month added to my car expense to have handled just those two repairs alone. Okay, housing. Santa Fe County, two bedroom, two bathroom apartment plus utilities. Tell me what you got. 1,400. Okay. 1,400, 1,500. 1,000. 1,000. I have given this presentation with these numbers for a long time in Santa Fe County. Everyone universally says they think MIT got it wrong on the low end. Um, they laugh and say, where can I find that? Please give it to me. Um, $1,069. Little on the low end. All right, medical, show me what you got. 250. Okay. 100. What else? 200 if they're relatively healthy. 200 if they're relatively healthy. 400 if they're not. Okay. What if they're paying their premiums out of pocket? I didn't count that. <laughs> That's gonna be more than a thousand dollars. Okay. 
So the number I'm giving you is considering the aggregate, right? So it's going to have people that have some employer supported healthcare and people who don't. So it comes out a little bit above what y'all were talking about because it includes both sides of the spectrum. All right. Um, that is 544. And isn't it true that most minimum wage jobs do not include medical insurance? That is true, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, so hold that thought because, yes, that's part of the equation in this experience. Okay? Vacation. Um, right? Yeah. Okay, child care. A lot of you said you weren't sure that you knew this one anymore. What did you come up with? thousand dollars a thousand six hundred for a month twenty one dollars a month notably almost equivalent to the cost of housing so substantial in the other category this one usually trips people up two hundred three hundred eight hundred Again, I'm going to give a little context here. This runs 496. And it is because it's sort of the catch bucket for like school clothes because you've got kids going on there um, that, you know, cycle through clothes a lot more quickly. And it's also um, diapers. I like to think of it like you said, the Target run or the Walmart run. Yep. So it's all the things that you would get there, generally speaking. So we're talking diapers are mixed in here. That's a huge expense for families also. Um, school supplies, birthday stuff maybe, although that wasn't explicitly included in there. Um, what about food? 500. 1,200. Okay. Oh, I, you know what? I didn't explicitly say this. The food was all three meals, all snacks, all at home. No eating out um, for this. That, that's an important detail. I apologize. I didn't express that. Other people's ideas there? It would be 500. Okay. MIT Living Wage has that at 882 for the family of four. Okay, so to total all these up, if you were in one of the school groups, I'd make you do it yourself, um, but we're not doing that today. So total basic living expenses, $4,931. Going to jump over here and have a conversation really quick about what's missing from that budget. We talked about housing, transportation, medical care, what other things are part of your life that are missing from the budget we just talked about? Savings. Savings. Let's start there. Savings? Entertainment. 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 Okay. What else? Education. It's say more about that. Saving for college. Yeah, okay. How about other lessons, like piano lessons, dance mm -hmm. lessons, Little League, Lassie League? Extracurricular. Okay. What else? Let's see. They, they may not be able to do it, but there is no benevolent consideration at all. Sure, so no charitable giving. Yeah. Family vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, vacation and celebrations, you know, like birthdays and stuff. Yep, holidays. Mm hmm Not just as a mother to a six and a half year old, um, not just your own children's 
celebrations, but those of family members, those of friends, et cetera. So the social network of celebration and the money that's associated with that. How about internet? Yep. Also. Phone. Those are almost considered essential these days, certainly to get by, um, you know, job searching and so forth, staying connected. Um, those were not included in that budget. Another big one. Debt or student loan payments not included in that budget. Any other things pop up for you guys that are part of your life maybe, but are not included in the budget we talked about? What about pets? Pets. Absolutely. Also by being responsible for other family members? Other family, yep. So if you're taking care of an elderly parent, if you're caring for somebody else's child, you know, certainly the capacity to do that. Any other things there? Okay, so we have a basic needs budget that looks like this. $4,931 every month, okay? Do you guys jot down those numbers there? You can just write down the total, $4,931, what the basic living expense looks like. And we know that we are missing these <laughs> items from that budget to begin with. You divide, you multiply that by 12, you get a big number. Yes. So now that you bring it up, why don't we talk about income for the family in our simulation, okay? I said that we would get back to the discussion about minimum wage here. So I am going to give you a little bit of data here to move things along. We are looking at a family where there are two adults and two children. Both adults are able-bodied, they're in the workforce, and they are working full-time at a minimum wage job. A couple of factors that I would like you to consider, I call this the unicorn situation. Do you know what minimum wage in Santa Fe County is? 1050? Is that right? $12.10 as of 2020. Oh. So that number is among the highest in the nation. It's not the highest. There are some minimum wages that are at $15, um, but it's definitively more than most other areas in New Mexico, which are in the $9 range now. That's new. As of last year, New Mex most of New Mexico was still in the $7 range. $7.50, $7.75, $7.80. Um, so minimum wage in Santa Fe County is $12.10. So in some senses, the situation we're about to experience is the best case scenario for minimum wage. The first component of that is that it's $12.10 an hour, which is good. Um, good is in quotes there in case you couldn't see my face. Um, so another factor to consider is, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the minimum wage job market. Um, but how typical is it for minimum wage jobs to give a single employee 40 hours a week? I see some heads shaking. Not uh, No, not very, because then don't they have to give them insurance? They have to pay benefits if they give right. 40 hours a week. Right. That is kind of not the shtick of minimum wage employers. They cap employment at 40 hours a week or less for a single employee so that they evade having to pay for benefits. So it is uncommon 
to get 40 hours at one minimum wage job. Okay, so that's a factor. The 1210 is also a factor. Also, you can see on the equation here, we've got two adults who live with two small humans who are working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. How plausible is that? Again, I see the head shaking. How come? Because they get sick. They're children. My, uh, my significant other refers to his son as a disease squeegee. Okay, he touches all the things. He puts his face on all the things. Like in the pre-COVID times, oh my goodness, that child could get lice seven or eight times a year. So, yes, we've got um, no sick time. So our situation for our simulation here is pretty optimal because we have a high minimum wage, we have 40 hours a week at one job, we have no sick time being taken in the number I'm about to give you. The last factor that is also super, super meaningful to consider is that I am going to be giving you gross pay. I'm not going to take out the taxes. We all know that's a pretty big deal, right? Okay, so no social security, no taxes being removed from this. This family at 12, 10 an hour, two adults working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, is going to make $4,194 per month combined. Or, $50,336 per year combined. So let's go back here. What's the problem? Not enough. It's not enough. You are in the negative $737 every single month based on the basic budget and your income at minimum wage. And that's without any of those things being included. So you have a job to do now. This is the challenge. I need you with your friends that are here. You can all talk together. I'm not going to listen to you right now. I'll answer questions if you want me to. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to make the budget work. And I would encourage you to think bigger than couponing because you have $737 in deficit every single month to make up and you're not covering any of the items that are on the screen. So couponing or cutting each other's hair is not going to get it done. You can definitely do those things and cut a little out of your budget, but it's not going to be a big enough solution. So think big. What would you do if you were this family? And while it's nice, to say, I'll have grandma watch the kids, please consider that not everybody has a grandma to watch the kids. So come up with solutions, be creative. And I'm sure that more than one of you was just like, oh my goodness, thank goodness for safety net programs. I'm gonna get some food stamps and that's gonna help. Did any of you write down what your monthly income was? For, or your annual income, I'm sorry, $50,000. Every single safety net program has eligibility guidelines, SNAP, food stamps, welfare, which is also known as TANF, um, all of them, uh, housing assistance, child care assistance are all based on the federal poverty level and these percentages of poverty level. 
it's either poverty level itself, 150%, 185% of federal poverty level. You make too much money to qualify for any safety net program right now. You're not getting a dime in food stamps. You are not getting any housing assistance. You will not get any childcare assistance. You're too well off. So your job is to figure it out. You have 10 minutes, talk to each other, come up with big solutions. Use public transportation instead of having two vehicles for each. Carpool with someone else to cut some of those costs. Jill, it yep. It isn't um, child care now two hundred percent? You're right. So child care did go to two hundred percent. So you might qualify for a little bit. Um, I did have someone in the last seminar say that based on where this family's income was at, that they would probably get a credit of maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars a month because it's sliding scale. Um, so they would probably qualify for maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars. Second job. Well, they got second job if they've got full time already. People work sometimes more than twenty hours a week. They work. They work second job. I think they don't go to the doctor. I oh, think they're right. They go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. I suppose they can walk around, but they may be so well, He said middle ground oh. food. He said middle ground food. Maybe we have to lower that a little bit. Yep, you were on the second lowest out of five for the food plan. Oh, I thought you said there were three. Oh, five? <laughs> There's five. The, five, the fifth is, you know, the top rung is pretty high. So you could go to the thrifty food plan for sure. Um, and I hang, while you guys do that, I will look up sort of what that, how that changes things. Okay. Okay. You guys keep working. I'll look it up. Garage sales for some, act, some items. Well, but garage sales don't bring any, you know, that's a hundred, hundred dollars and that's your garage sale you know that's not enough to do anything no no i mean shopping garage sales oh, instead shopping of garage sales i see okay. i think we need to figure out something to do with the child care bill because that's it may be that that uh Hiring a private person may be less expensive than going to a center. I'm not sure. I don't know what. So it could be trading off childcare services to mm -hmm. help cut the cost. Then it suggested shift work, so they traded off yeah. uh, health care. Yeah, that would work. <laughs> Don't think you but could. This is for, for a large amount of the population. Not everybody can do shift work. Well, you could get rid of the, if you did cloth diapers, you could get rid of all those disposables. I'm gonna pipe in about diapers here. You cannot use a laundromat to launder cloth diapers. What? Nope. 
You have to have your own washer and dryer. Oh my. Because that's an extra expense. <laughs> Is there a law against a law against using laundromats for diapers? It's a public health thing. Oh. You would probably not have the medical care that you need and not not have the expenses of some of it. you would never go to the dentist. Well, you might do without health insurance. Mm -hmm. I think when Linda said get rid of one of the cars, I think that's probably a Probably a what? It's probably a good idea. Because with two cars, you got two sets of insurance. Yep. If you're covering the car with insurance. You could cut your, probably not cut it in half because you go more miles. Unless you're using public transportation. Mm -hmm. And that would depend upon the job, whether or not you could use public transportation. And you could cut maybe some of the housing costs by living with someone, you know, with another family member, another family. You have about three minutes left. Oh, for goodness sakes. The server for the citation around the low cost food plans is not responding. So I'm gonna, make, <laughs> I'm gonna make a note to look that up for you guys. I've done that in the past and I've seen it there. So I'm not really sure what the issue is, but I'll email it out to you guys instead. Well, I don't know how much we cut by suggesting these things. I'm not gonna tell you. Um, keep brainstorming. There's more than one solution. There's not some one size fits all answer that I'm going to be telling you all how to solve this problem. If that was the case, I wouldn't be spending my time here with you ladies today. Okay? I'd be in Costa Rica where I really want to be. Nobody's One of them could do an online type of job and thus um, cut the daycare. Do part, you mean do part, of your, part of your job is, is that? For instance, a transcriptionist types from home mm. sometimes. Well, they could take a night shift, I guess. Something yeah. that's 24-7. Yeah, it's not great. Hopefully we're suggesting. Okay, 45 seconds to solve the world's problems. 
But you can do you can do little things, and little things do add up, like like cutting your own hair and um, having a garden, or you know, or, you know, growing some of your own food, or cutting back on your food a little bit. You know, some of those a lot, some of those things just add up. They don't solve the problem. Sure. And is that these families live in the places that are food desert. So they don't have the opportunity to shop for the same food that you have if you get in the car and drive to the grocery store. Okay, let's pause for a second. You've thrown out a lot of wonderful things that I, I'm excited for us to dig in and discuss. Um, before we do that, I'm going to throw up another screen here. In putting yourself in this space and taking the perspective of someone that's trying to make this budget work. What are the feelings that exist around that? Frustration. Stress. Stress. <laughs> okay. You feel like you ought to be able to make it work. <laughs> okay. Okay, what else? Sadness. Okay. Deprived. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes there would be anger and it could be anger between the members of the, the couple, the two members. Oh, okay. Sure. So let's uh, good on the feelings part. Let's let's talk here a little bit um, in terms of impacts. Um, interpersonal stress, right? Relationship strain. We're talking about, yeah. Okay. I'm using my phone. Yeah. Yeah. Wishing that, how about wishing that the uh, minimum wage was a little more of a livable wage? Sure. Um, so wishing it was different, wishing wage mm -hmm. was different? Yeah. Okay. I don't know how it is, but it seems wrong that if you are paying working at a full-time job well no that's not what i'm trying to say where you are working at minimum wage and that never being a full-time job that is not fair in terms of that the companies won't give you full-time work at the minimum wage job sure okay okay so Let's talk through some of your solutions that we came up with here. I'm going to create a new note for this. Um, and I am going to do a little pushback, okay? I don't want anybody to feel targeted or me telling you that you have terrible ideas because that's certainly not what it is. I'm going to give you a little bit of what about and ask questions so we can sort of see the ripple effects because every decision we make has consequences, right? Um, everything we cut or everything we adjust has a ripple effect and we just need to be aware of what those ripples are. Um, so I am not going to be saying that absolutely that's not a solution. I just want to tease out the thinking so that we consider some of the implications of it. Does that seem fair? Okay. So public transportation, we decided on that as a way to cut out maybe a third or so of the transportation budget, um, a third to a half maybe, if we were lucky. Were we talking about removing cars completely and using public transit or were we talking about just taking out one car? 
One car. One car. Okay. Um, talk to me about what some of the ripple effects are about rem going from a two car to a one car household. My turn to have the car. <laughs> My turn. And different job times. Okay. Get the child to daycare, or you have to pick up the child from daycare before they close. So there's some scheduling stuff that needs to happen around being a one car household. Is it surmountable? Sure. sure. But you have two different adults and two different kids and all of you are in four different places, right? Because that two year old's in daycare, the one child is theoretically in school. Ha ha ha, maybe not right now. Um, <laughs> And then those two adults are in different places. Now we talked at the beginning also about how the 40 hours a week was unlikely to come from one location, right? So there's some possibility that those adults are also juggling multiple locations and having to shift change from one job to another at different points in the day. Just a ripple, can it be navigated? Yes. Is it a place to save some money? Yes. Is it without complication? No. No, of course not. Nothing is in this life, right? Um, so you're gonna put down as a solution, go to one car. With the understanding that this has complications, right? And when we looked at some of the impacts of you talked about stress, going to one car can compound that, right? Can add to the stress points of a child that doesn't get picked up on time, somebody ended up late for work because of drop-offs and yada yada, right? Um, just making it known there. So sure, we could cut out some dollars around one car. What else? We talked about, health. somebody talked about cutting healthcare. Talk about the ripples. Emergent, you you end up with having to pay when you do go to the doctor, and you don't go to the doctor when you have to, unless you ha unless you absolutely have to. But often, without preventive care, you get even worse, and then it costs even more. Mm -hmm. Source of debt. Say that again. A huge source of debt. Yes. The, the other thing too is I think some employers will require you to get a doctor's note saying that you're sick so you need to stay home or you are well so you can go to work. So that costs money and you have to do it if you're keeping a job. Mm -hmm. While we're talking about public health stuff, and I know that we're in a moment in our history here with the pandemic that makes us think about this a little more consciously, when someone's working a minimum wage job and they're trying to get to that 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, what kind of impacts do we see from that? I don't understand what you're saying. Stress, not enough rest. Not enough sure. But do they stay home when they're sick? Not often. <laughs> no, a lot of times they're, I mean, they need to make the money. So unless they're really, really sick, they're gonna go to work. Right. And, and that's what I was talking about. I actually have uh, my son's girlfriend. She has to have a doctor's note saying she's too sick to come to work. Now right. I don't know that they're doing that now, but that's how it was before COVID. Absolutely, so the lack of having sick leave and the lack of medical insurance maybe or reduced medical coverage can put us in a situation where we can't get sick, you know, doctor's notes. People are going to be working while they're sick. And what are the consequences of that? We're living it right now. Other people get sick. <laughs> we have a public health challenge around that, right? So I definitely have had my moment before COVID, we'll say in January of 2020, of being in the checkout line at a given store and hearing a nice wet cough from the cashier and being like, ew, why are you here? 
I think we're all a little more germ phobic today than we were in January, um, some more so than others. So certainly there's a public health impact of that, right? Of having people that are working while they're sick to try to make that money. Um, all right, other solutions you came up with. We talked about cutting healthcare and going to one car. What was another solution there? The work shifts or have one person work from home to cut out daycare okay. or, or maybe an alternate form of transportation, a, a motorcycle or moped or something like that. Okay. That's another more dangerous expense. Right. It could be medical later, right? <laughs> <laughs> Especially the drivers. Or on the back of a motorcycle. We've done that before. <laughs> I mean, we do have a child transportation issue around that. Um, it might work for one of the adults to use that, but certainly it doesn't incorporate children, hopefully. Eek. Um, all right, so shift work and working from home. Talk about the ripples there, the challenges around that. Let's discuss that a little bit. Working from home. Kids are bouncing all over you while you're trying to work at home with the kids there and the dog barks and you just can't get the work done and you got your housework that still needs to be done. Should I go on? <laughs> we are all living this right now. Um, talk to me a little bit about which employers are offering work from home. So more related to a computer. I mean, we definitely are talking about um, when we go back to our original typical budget that we need to have internet, we need to have a computer, we need to have like the setup stuff, right? Um, minimum wage jobs offering work from home typically? Not as much. So hopefully, I mean, for people who are in the higher wage earning jobs, which isn't this situation anyways, working from home is an option. Um, as a lady who is doing the work from home with a child present thing lately, I'm going to concur with the dog barking and the kid climbing into the aquarium while you're trying to do a Zoom meeting with somebody important. Um, certainly, we're all figuring it out. Is it possible? Sure. Shift work. Talk a little bit about that in northern New Mexico. Well, I know uh, it, it's very specific. I know uh, one of my brothers worked at a um, at the newspaper, which they probably don't have those kind of jobs so much now. And he was a printer, and so he worked nights, and his wife worked days. Um, yeah. Also, she was a nurse at one point, so she worked nights and he worked days. But then they had to try to take care of the kids while they were also trying to sleep. So it was hard. Okay. So possible if you can land in a field where there's shift work available, right? So if you've got medical profession, um, stuff overnight at the hospital, if you can get stock shifts at one of the retail places that does that overnight, um, maybe not as readily available as it is in a big city, um, but certainly there, maintenance, cleaning, those types of things overnight um, can happen, but we are having potentially a downstream health consequence about, I'm taking care of the kids and I'm awake all day, I grab a two hour nap and I go off to you know work an eight hour shift or more, right? So definitely a possibility, that's a great saver if you can get some childcare benefit out of that. What else? Another impact would be um, working different shifts so you can take care of the kids, but then you don't see each other very much. Okay, definitely. Great. Well, I was just thinking child care from home. You take care of other people's children in your home. Okay. okay. <laughs> and keep the job also. No, no, no. That is your job. That is your job. Okay. I asked this from a genuine place. Does anybody know any of the rules around that from a legal perspective? You have to get registered. Okay. So you have to be registered to do that. What are there things associated with that? Uh, yes, home visit for safety, of course. 
Okay. So number regulations like one adult, so many children, and different numbers for different ages. I'm to an there, there's a lot of licensing to it. Yeah, but I don't think a lot of people do licensing. No. Okay. So certainly an option that you maybe, s did anybody consider stepping out of the workforce? Having one person, one adult step out of the workforce. You lose your pay. You lose your pay, that's true. Yeah, but you don't have childcare well, anymore. Be half of what it is. So you've already lost that much more of your income for mm -hmm. your expenses you couldn't get to begin with. Right. You lose so. your pay, but you also lose your childcare expense. But you'll, but it, but you, if you just, if you work part time, you could get into some of these benefits, and it might be worth more to you to have those benefit those, you know, right, these things than yep. it is to to work full time. Yep. Now, do you think it happens? Sure. Sure. Somebody cuts back to part time so they can manage the child care component of it. They drop their income enough to qualify for some benefit programs. But here's the deal about that cyclical nature of poverty. A lot of those programs have lifetime limits. They have work requirements. They have other things that have been put in place um, for eligibility pieces. So it may seem in the moment like it's a good idea to drop your hours, drop a job, stay home and take care of your own kids. But in six months when your lifetime eligibility for food stamps expires, you have to do something else. When you have tapped out the maximum amount of TANF that you can receive in your lifetime, you have to come up with another solution. So safety net programs aren't permanent either. Um, and I would give you a, they change a lot. They change frequently. They're different amongst all programs for how long a person can access different safety net programs. So there's some variation there as well. Um, but do you think it happens that people step away from the workforce in order to access benefit programs? Sure. Um, stop work, reduce hours. What are some of the consequences of going that route? If you have to go on assistance programs. Yeah, you have to go on the program. And that, doesn't, and that doesn't feel good. Right. So if we go into the like, how does it feel side there, we've got some big fat red shame. You also lose some of your training and your experience. If you do go back into the workforce a year later, years later, um, they've moved on without you. <laughs> I had yeah. a when you have gaps in your resume, you look unhirable, maybe. You're not as good as another candidate, okay? Skills are not as good as they were before. Yeah, you're not as relevant, sure. Okay. Okay, so the point of this, we could go on in a lot of different directions with the solutions. The point is mostly, which I would like you to take away, that. There are definitely solutions, but every solution has downstream consequences that add complications um, that have to be considered as you try to make ends meet, as you try to connect the dots. And once again, it's worth noting that as you make this headway towards, okay, we got rid of one of the cars, we are making some sacrifices, but we're figuring it out, we're meeting our basic budget, that you are still missing all these things. Hello. So maybe you got yourself to break even. You made up the difference of that $737. You added 10 more hours a week. Somebody else has stepped away to part time. You know, you've made some differences. Um, but you're still not saving money. Do you know the pre-pandemic, Forbes released an article saying that 78% of Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. 
I can speak from the food bank perspective that it took two weeks after the closures were implemented for us to see the number of people seeking food assistance explode at our drive-through food pantry. We went from 1,200 people per week to 4,000 people per week in the matter of four weeks. It took less than a month. And that was before, you know, unemployment benefits and all those things started to kick in. There was this gap of two, four, six weeks where a lot of those assistance programs didn't come to the rescue. And we saw the numbers lines a mile and a half long. You saw them around the country that people were completely without savings. And when a catastrophe hit that affected all levels of people, they were profoundly affected and immediately affected. So that's a really, really big deal. Um, and something that we must keep our eye on in that regard. So let me, why doesn't this move when I want it to? Um, I love Zoom. I've lost one of my boxes that says, I don't want to share my screen anymore. Um, I said that I'd bring us back to advocacy, and I mean it. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. This is the big heavy. When we look at, we'll go back to one of these screens about like what the impacts are. When we have profound stress in households, that leads to negative outcomes within families. What are some of those outcomes? Abuse. Yep. Blame. Yep. Divorce. Abuse. Alcohol and drug. Addiction. And what kind of environment does that create for children who are growing up in those families? Not good. <laughs> Not good. Here's a little bit of homework. I don't know what all y'all's backgrounds are professionally um, and intellectually on this planet. Um, but it is worth looking up ACEs. That's adverse childhood ugh, experiences. This is the big buzzword in child development these days, ACEs. And essentially there's a scoring mechanism. So as a child, especially during different periods of childhood, so zero to three, and then, you know, like five to 10 and so forth, different negative experiences contribute to your ACEs score. So divorce, living in a home where addiction is present, living in a home where you witness interpersonal violence, living in a home where there is food insecurity, living in a home where there is frequent bouts, there are frequent bouts of being unhoused or homeless. Um, every one of those adds a number to your score. So the higher your score, the more impacted your life is. And there's some really fascinating brain research that shows what a high ACE or does physically to your actual brain and what kind of physical and socio-emotional consequences there are down the line. They're finding incredible links between cancer mm. as adults and high ACE scores. Um, weird autoimmune disorders linked again to high ACE scores. There's a lot of really fascinating science and it sounds a little wooga wooga on the surface um, but you dig into it and there's a lot of really credible institutions that are having these conversations about the impacts on children. So level number one, obviously everybody wants to save adults too. Um, I, I don't want to see seniors in bad situations. We definitely don't want to see our regular adults in bad situations, but our children are our most precious resource. And the longer that we have children living in poverty situations, the more their lives are changed and the more we lose as a society. Um, so shifting gears just for the final closing piece, there is room 
for you to become an advocate. And I asked you early on how many of you were sure that you knew exactly how much was you were sure that you knew how much every single category cost and nobody raised their hand nobody said yes to that so my question to follow that up is how many of you are totally certain that every single one of your elected officials has that knowledge uh yeah no. <laughs> i'm already making you happier or those tears um they're tears that's something that matters. If our elected officials are not aware of what it looks like to be in a family that's struggling to make ends meet, and 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, there is a disconnect between policy makers and policy receivers. And the meaningful part of you being here today and you taking part in this exercise is that, man, we all need a little bit of perspective taking. And we talked a little bit about privilege at the beginning. And one thing that all of you have is the privilege of having a voice that can be heard. You can choose to show up in a variety of different places. One, you can show up as an advocate spreading this kind of knowledge about how tight that economic precipice is. You can share that in your social circles and in your family. I am a notorious person in my family for when I hear somebody say, you know, people are just like working the system. Nobody says that kind of thing around me anymore because I'm very proactive in non-confrontationally because these are my family members, they're my friends, I don't want to be rude. But I can step into that space and say, actually, did you know that 78% of Americans are struggling to make ends meet? and are living paycheck to paycheck. And it, did you know that food distribution after the pandemic doubled within one month? That shows us that a lot more people need help than we thought, that not as many people are financially secure as we thought. And I try to throw little pieces of education into my daily interactions with my family and with my friends, and I try to get brave and step into those spaces. Um, and you can be an advocate in your personal relationships. If somebody says something that you know is not correct, do your research, you know, come armed with actual whole, cold hard facts um, and find the piece you care about. Do you care about affordable childcare? Do you care about raising the minimum wage? Do you care about having equitable housing opportunities? Pick your piece, research it, know some things, and then speak up. The time for silence was a long time ago, okay? Um, being silent no longer serves us. So step up in your personal relationships. You can also choose to step up on the intermediate level. So public discourse, although we're not out in public so much anymore, but oh man, was I that lady in the grocery store lines that would absolutely call out someone for shaming someone about food stamps. Absolutely. Um, if I saw someone shaming someone else for what they purchased with their EDP card, you bet I had a food stamp statistic on hand. Um, in my wider social circles, if I you know, was hearing someone speaking in a larger social group about, oh, you know what, like I'm tired of you know, undocumented people getting food stamps. Actually, did you know that people who don't have a social security number and are undocumented can't access federal support programs like food stamps? That's not a thing. Did you know that the fraud rate in the food stamps program is less than 4%, which is better than any other single government program that involves support systems, including the military. Um, so I arm myself with some facts and I can distribute those at the local level. And I also encourage you to do that with government. And that's sort of my bigger, larger action step. We can all choose to be advocates in a larger context, whether that be with our county commissioners, um, 
whatever elected official feels comfortable to you. You can scream at your federal level representatives as much as you want. Um, but definitely get involved in local stuff. Also vote, make sure you're registered to vote. Do your census, please, please, please. Tell everyone you know to do their census. These are little ways that we can get involved and start affecting change by offering this perspective. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, but we act like we're all millionaires waiting to happen. There's a disconnect there. So we're still thinking that people who use food stamps are lazy, but many of us are a few lost paychecks away from needing it. And that's a disconnect that we need to close. And I think that the first step in a lot of that is raising awareness. And you can do that from the small level to the large level. You can go to the town hall meetings that your elected officials hold and show up and say, you know what, I've looked into it. And these are the statistics around poverty and hunger and wage gap and housing accessibility and childcare accessibility in our community. And I don't think that's okay. And I want to see you take that on as a major issue. You're all capable of doing that. Um, and we can all be big enough and brave enough to do that. Uh, and I'll give you one very personal example of that that's not related to the job that I'm paid to do. Four years ago, nearly, I left an abusive relationship, um, an abusive marriage specifically. And in planning to do that, um, there were four handguns in my house that I was not the owner of. And the statistics show that when women leave, women get hurt. And I was very, very worried about those handguns being in my home. And through my process of planning, I asked multiple, multiple people what I could do to make sure that when I finally left, those guns weren't around because I felt unsafe. And the answer was resoundingly nothing. They weren't mine. Um, moving them would be theft. Um, disabling them would be destruction of property. There were lots of barriers to me doing anything about them at all. And about a month afterwards, um, with a restraining order in my hand, I was giving this presentation over at Santa Fe Prep, and I bumped into Miranda, who works with New Mexicans Against Gun Violence, and we were all having a chat, all the presenters about our work and I asked her what their legislative priorities were and her priority for that year their group's priority was getting guns removed from the homes of persons who had temporary restraining orders against them and that felt pretty personal to me in that moment and I said oh my gosh thank you for working on that um, generally supportive of gun ownership um, I don't have a problem with it in theory, as long as it's sensible and well controlled, but I, it, this one was a soft spot for me. I didn't want those guns in my home. And she said, we really need your story. And I said, I'm not sure I can do that. I have a custody thing and this is really messy and it's really scary. And she said, you write your story anonymously and we'll get someone to read it for you on the floor. And I did, and they did. And they passed that legislation. And I had a little small role in that because I had a story to share about how I was directly impacted by that piece. And that means that thousands of women in this state have been able to feel a little bit safer when they choose to leave unsafe situations. And I played a little bit of a part in that by being brave enough to share my story with someone who had a voice that was bigger than mine. And that is something that I think every single one of you can do. You can find a way to share your relevant story or someone else's relevant story in a forum where it can be heard and it can be put into action to make change happen. And that is what I got. Um, I would challenge you to find the space every day, every week, every month, where you can take a little step forward and make people aware of how real poverty is in our community, how important it is to support legislative pieces that empower rather than disenfranchise people who are living on the edge.
financially and how we can make our communities healthier and more affluent in so, so many ways. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. <laughs> I agree. We just need to speak up. We can't be quiet. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. First of all, having worked um, ages ago for $1.19 an hour, which was the minimum wage at the time, are the prices all going to go up if, say, there was a federal increase in minimum wage? I'm not against people getting a fair wage. Um, uh -huh. But how do we keep the prices from going up so that they, they and everybody else can still not afford it? And the other thing is, is there a way to get companies that do minimum wage to employ for 40 hours a week and have to pay benefits? And, but then can all companies do that? Small companies at least. All really good questions. And what do you do about all of that? Living up conversations are complicated. There's no question. It's not as simple as make it $15 an hour and everybody is fine. If it was that simple, we may have already done it. Mm -hmm. um, so it is so important to explore the issues fully and understand all the ripples, just like the ones we talked about. Um, certainly the Corporate conversation is a really interesting one for major corporations that are avoiding full-time employment and avoiding benefits. Um, that's a really rich conversation, potentially. And that's a government issue. We've got to be involved with our leaders and, and have them be, you know, say, you've got to be responsible for the people that work under you and provide the benefits. small human yeah, if you've got so many employees that are working just under the minimum wage there's a problem well and under the minimum um 40 hours a week yeah yep and that is definitely the kind of thing you can look into and you can start to push for um that's a really good example of finding a solution that maybe you believe in you do the work around really researching it and looking into it and then that's your thing um i certainly wouldn't come to your elected official with every single thing that we talked about today child care <laughs> house women wages all the things pick the spots you're passionate about because that's where your your ability to affect change comes from and certainly like step into those spaces armed and dangerous with some really good information about this is a solution that I think could work and I wanna see you support this. Oh, thank you so much, Jill. You have just <laughs> opened our eyes. Hi. Oh, there's a little girl here. This is Avalon. She is my first grader. <laughs> here, look at this one. She's got her, she had her mask on. Oh, we've lost some. Apple tooth, wow. <laughs> no, she's a vampire right now. I just got here. Ah, she's right. here. She is a homeschooler right now, and she is going to do social studies by volunteering here today. Ah. <laughs> oh. well. well, we better let you go, but we thank you so much. And we're going to put this on our website, uh, well, on, on uh, YouTube, and then the other people can see it. And... and know know what's going on too so really oh, thank you very much for having me today i really appreciate the opportunity so okay. what is this thanks thank you jill so thank you you you, you, you are welcome to leave <laughs> what is that what is that a what a dried up cantaloupe <gasps> oh my god wow <laughs> Are you, going to put it in, are you going to put it in your compost pile? No. It might be a little past compost at this point. It's wow. still work, working on petrified. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Joy's uh, a big tank. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you all very, very much for this opportunity. Thank I appreciate thank that. You. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> Okay, Sheila, you need to un unmute yourself. You don't have control of muting and unmuting. I have Carol. no idea where it is. I don't. I thought the I thought that um, it was done in by somebody that ran the Sunday school class, but I don't know how to do those things either. I don't either because we don't because we don't do that in Sunday school. People mute themselves. Sheila, up in the cor up in the top right corner, is there something that says mute or unmute if you use your your pointer on the screen? Bottom left on ours. Oh, oh Don's here. Don's there. There. Yeah. Don. I just it happens to be the lower left corner on a on a uh, yeah. laptop. So yeah, that's where mine is. Oh, here we are. Go. <laughs> Have we had? Oh, they also work. She's we, trying to work, switches back and forth. Good. All A at the same time. At the I same know. time. Yeah. With the uh, uh, shift on? Or no, 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 no. All no. A. Okay. Yeah. All okay. Just, A. Okay. Anyway, all first and then A. thank you for everybody being here. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> now we should all get to go home and have some, a piece of chocolate. <laughs> pretend, <laughs> pretend we just had this at somebody's house. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, Braylon. Hi, Braylon. <laughs> yeah. Did Opalie it's go for our chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there anything anybody wants to bring up? about our meetings or should we have them should we find programs what do you think well i think we ought to <laughs> we ought to create and discover is going to proceed with it in october we'll have someone doing the um pledge service program and in November will be the uh, World Thank Offering, and we don't have something past that. But I think we're going to see if we can get volunteers to lead programs. That's what we need to do. I think that's where we are. Yeah. Yes, I can say that and then not show up for the October one, by the way. Did Carol and Opal Lee get my email? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. When will you be back, Kathy? I don't know. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm headed for Nebraska to, to help my sister recover from um, a knee operation, Ooh. which will happen on the 7th. And I don't know when I'll be back. Hopefully, you'll have to look in your email because the things that were sent out went to you and Carol or everybody. Of course, um, Martha Circle could tune in to, since we're doing this on Zoom, you can tune in to the Create and Discover programs also. Yes. When I first got here to Los Alamos, we had not only the two circles, but also there would be once a month, um, all the circles, all the UMW would meet for one meeting besides it wasn't executive it was another meeting mm -hmm. and maybe we need to think about doing it that way there that might be, we can share each other's programs to, we can just have one a month if that would work out for both of us i mean to join together think right. about that one it would have to be in in the evening for those that work. Yes. That's why we haven't been able to put it together because of having the timing to suit the, the per person's needs. Yeah. Yeah. But now that we've got 
now that we've got Zoom, those that didn't get out in the evening would still be able to pick up on the programming mm -hmm. by doing Zoom at home. Yes. Well, I think that's something we would have to discuss at executive and, you know, this isn't something we can decide at Martha Circle, but it's something that we can talk about. Okay, the thing, uh, Kathy Duncan said she would love to come to Martha Circles. She came to Create and Discover last month and she said she would love to come to Martha Circle next month if we do this, so. Kathy, who? Duncan, the, the, the district president. Um, yes, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds good. Hmm. Do we have anything else? So are you the upcoming meetings? I've got. Okay, I've got what, what we had did at, at executive. Um, Audrey's Chumley came and got all the baby bundle stuff. And so that's now down at, at um, in, in, in Espanola. And they've taken, she's taken 12 bags to the hospital down there. For, mm -hmm. and so, so we're starting, that's set starting back up. Um, we think we'll get started for girls for um, days for girls is going to start in in October, and we can do it okay. at the ship center because we'll have enough space so we can social distance. Mm. All righty, that sounds good. And tomorrow is is book group, and we're discussing right here right now. And uh, I'm, I have no clue who's coming. We'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, if you have pledges, you can send, just send them directly to Janice. Um, to you. Collect on Zoom. Send them to who, Carol? To Janice. Janice. Oh, Janice. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Send them to Janice. Um, All right. Boom, 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 boom. What else we got here? Um, oh, we decided that we have two special recognition pins we haven't given out. And we're not going to wait to get back at church to do that. And I'm going to take them. And Opali said she'd come and come and do that with me one of these days. So so we will do that. That sounds good. Yes. And uh, so, and if you didn't get to see the paper for water thing, it it's on um, YouTube at the church site. Okay. And we have given five hundred dollars to the ARC for ARC scholarships. They've got a family that they could use money at this point. I guess that's the that's the main the main things that we talked about at executive. Okay. <clears throat> so what what are, what are we planning for? Next month, are we look? Are you looking for a volunteer, Sheila? Are you? What are you looking for? I'm always looking for volunteers. Yes. <laughs> so I think. Hmm. See what we need to do. Do we need to contact Ms. Uh, Mrs. Dordery? Is her name Dordery, or what did you say her name was? Duncan, okay. Yeah, Duncan, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I, can yes. just, I can just email her. Yes. I believe that Kathy said she would be willing to do a program. Yeah, she did. She wanted she did. to ask her to. I think, I think she's been a professional woman in her career. I think she would be in a given excellent program on whatever it is. She's, she is very active in church life in Albuquerque, so it would be good. So it would be her choice, you're saying? So we could see. It's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I, okay. yeah, she said she would be willing to do a program, so 
You want me to ask her to do that? Or would you like me to call her or, or you want to take care of that? I'll let you call her. <laughs> That's my volunteer right there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will give you the information. <laughs> okay. So, okay. All righty. And then we need to talk. Why don't you uh, people think about whether we should join together? Is that possible? Do we want to, if we join together, it might be a Saturday. And how many people would care whether we, now that we don't have to get out and about, maybe uh, it would be good for one, one program. So think about all the ways that we might want to do that. Well, we would, you consider, would you consider doing it on the second Thursday, which is already Circle Night for um, Create and Discover? Mm -hmm. That's one thing we can consider. Well, okay. I think, I think that this is something we talk about at Executive and I think we got a bu bunch of executive people right here right now. So we, we, yes. we already are thinking about it. And so we can think about it some more and then discuss it there. And we'll add the, uh, add the other couple people that are on executive. We, we can talk about yeah. it. Okay. All right. Let's do that then. All right. Let me write it down. Write it down, yes. <laughs> oh, we had one exciting thing. Oh, oh, we got um, annual meeting, conference annual meeting on the 23rd and 24th. It's on the 23rd, it's going to be at four o'clock in the afternoon. That's the district meeting. And that's the meeting at which we will be awarded our uh, Mission Today Award and all the reading program awards. And we had 13 people that completed plans this year and that is the most in the district. Wow, so, there we go. So congratulations. <laughs> we got people sitting right here. <laughs> good job, Carol. <laughs> So, Good. so everybody's invited and when we get the Zoom thing, I'll send it out to everybody because we can all go. We don't have to go anywhere, so we can all go. That's right. <laughs> we can all go. Yeah, and oh. Saturday is going to be at 10 o'clock and that'll be the conference meeting. You're talking about this Thursday? No, October. No, no, October 23rd and 24th. 23rd of my, of October. Okay. So. And Janet can join us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we should, should look around and see the people that we haven't seen for a long time. Like I'm missing a lot of people in choir. Mm -hmm. And several of those people I tried to get a hold of to maybe they would be interested in joining Zoom in our meetings. And um, I think there might be something we can think about including so that they don't drop out of place completely. So I'm a little worried about that, that we don't yeah, see idea. them. Yeah. So we'll plan on calling people that we haven't heard from for six months or something. <laughs> It's great to have Marilyn with us today, even though for us, she looks like a black rectangle. I think maybe she can see. <laughs> yes, I'm glad you did that. Thank you very much. And Julie was helping out a lot. So thank you, Julie. And Marilyn, that's really wonderful to have you included. Well, have, have we fi have we finished? Maybe somebody has a special prayer. Oh, 
would, would somebody volunteer to let's say a prayer to get us out of, for today's special? Would somebody volunteer? Can we use the Mizpah benediction and now may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from the other? Very good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I have a prayer request. Um, yeah. Good friends of ours. Um, her husband, had, it's a something that his arteries tear. And his arteries have been tearing this week and he's been in the hospital twice. And one of them was pronounced a, a heart attack because of it. And, Ooh. you know, they're, they're just kind of overwhelmed. They've got two kids and, and uh, three kids, three kids. And, you know, they're just, just, fe just feeling overwhelmed with all the stuff that's going on. He's been in the hospital mm -hmm. twice now. And uh, in the last- First day. names? Hmm? First names? Oh, uh, Eric, Eric McKee. Yeah, Eric, all right, thank you. And that's what we were discussing. You know, medical can, can psych you out if you don't have the mm -hmm. medical insurance and everything. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Kathy, I hope that your sister does well. What is her name? Barb. Barb. Barb, yep. Thank you. Yeah, if you would keep her on, on the list and travel mercies for Don and me and Craig's going to come over from Ohio uh, for a visit, we would appreciate it. Very good. All right. So you're driving. We are driving. Yes. Um, it, in some ways, it seems safer than flying. And I'm not sure, you know, you either get in car accidents or you catch COVID. So uh, <laughs> this way we can, we can take a hundred some pounds of weights to Craig and, um, or to, Nebraska, Craig will pick them up but along with a few other things. Good. But if I can't really find a place for, if it fits in the car, it's going and he can take it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're not we're not in New York in the middle of of October. It, the airlines changed things on us enough, and we just can't figure out a way that works that we're, ha we're com comfortable with, so we're not going. Does your, or did your brother have a wife that's still living? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, okay. no. Mm -hmm. oh, Carol, I'm so sorry for you. That is a lot to have to give up. I know you feel like you have to, but it is a lot to give up. In both the CB and the Went families, we have done um, services for departed members, sometimes considerable amount of time afterwards, and it still brings the family together. So I hope you have a chance to do that when things are safer. That is a good idea. Like Fred. DeVries is thinking of having a service for Hazel a year from when she died and her yep. kids. I think that's probably a good way. Yeah, as far as getting together in our family, it's, it's almost never been, at least lately, it's never been right at the time. Mm -hmm. And it, and it just, that's the way it works and get you still um, get the family together, which is really the goal. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think the, uh, the person is any less um, honored. Almost everyone we have 
gotten together with outside on our patio. We ended up talking about the ideas of what to do when someone passes and how to do it and how they're thinking of what that makes them think about. So maybe putting it away for a while does give us better thinking of what we want to do besides what we think our loved ones might have wanted. So it's everyone is kind of thinking about things mm -hmm. like that. been great to be together. <laughs> yeah. Good Bye. I know. Thanks. Glad so you could join us, Janet. <laughs> yes, Janet. She's got she's got a different community to think through this about with. <laughs> yeah. She's yeah. everybody. <laughs> Harriet's daughter. Oh, oh. Good. So come back. I love you all. Take care. Bye. Stay safe.